So, I'm bringing a little bit of a different voice of hope, uh, the voice from what probably most people think is an unlikely quarter to have voices of hope, and that's the business world. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about business as usual, uh, but rather what I call beautiful business. And uh, that's the name of my uh, new book, and I first started using that concept when I lived upstairs above the White Dog Cafe that I ran for many years, and I had a sign in my business, uh, in my bedroom closet, that when I opened uh, the door, I would see each morning that said, good morning, beautiful business. And it was a reminder to me of just how beautiful business can be when we put our energy and our care and our creativity uh, into producing a product or a service that our community actually needs. And it was a time in the morning that I would think about my own business and how the farmers were out in the fields picking organic fruits and vegetables to bring into town and the um, animals out in fresh air and pasture. And I'd think of my goat herder, Dougie, who said that when she kissed her goat's ears, it made the cheese better. And I think that's probably true. So for me, business is about relationships. Relationships with everybody that we buy from and sell to and work with, and about our relationship with Earth itself. My business was really the way that I expressed my love of life, uh, and that's what made it a thing of beauty. So I'm going to just read a short passage uh, from my book, which gives a, an overview. I don't have my glasses. Hold on a minute. Oh, I'll try her. <laughs> yeah, they work. OK. Most of us geezers can use the same glasses. This book is both a love story and a business book. It's about a love of life, nature, animals, community, and unique local culture. A love of good food and family farms, and a love of democracy, all being threatened by a global economic system driven by profit. It's also about a deep love of business and how we can embrace a way of doing business that is beautiful, that nurtures all that we cherish, and that furthers the creation of a whole new economic system based on caring relationships. Though this new economy is global in vision, my story, and the story for each of us, begins right at home, in our own community, and with our own capacity to recognize and protect what we truly care about. So, uh, this was my place uh, for 40 years, a row house of uh, Victorian brownstone in West Philadelphia that when I moved into it in 1972 was about to be torn down, and I joined that fight to protect our block from uh, demolition uh, where they had planned to build a mall full of chain stores and um, fast food restaurants. So I was appalled by this and I think that's when I first got into this work around globalization, around localization to fight off globalization uh, for my own community. Uh, but I chose this place uh, in the world to be my community, a place where I would start a business, raise a family, uh, build community, um, and to become knowledgeable of that place. And I think that's the first step in building a local economy, a sustainable local economy, or what I like to say a living economy, is to choose our place and to take responsibility uh, for that place. So uh, here are my kids, uh, Grace and Lawrence, who were two and four when I opened the White Dog Cafe uh, in 1983, originally just as a coffee and muffin shop. And I put them uh, uh, in this slide because I want to make the point that I lived and worked in the same community. Uh, we really we lived above the shop, like the old-fashioned way of doing business, like the family farm or the family inn or the corner store. Now, oftentimes in business schools, we'll, we're told to leave our values at home uh, when we go to uh, work. And so there's a real separation between work life and family life. Uh, so we, we, we teach our kids the golden rule uh, when we're at home, and then we get to work and gold rules. And that brings a lot of unhappiness with this uh, separation. And also, when we live and work in the same community, we see every day the people that are affected uh, by our decisions, whether they're our employees or our neighbors, our customers, our suppliers, our, our environment. And we're more likely to make decisions from the heart as well as from the head. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those decisions for me. One was my relationship with my employees. The person on the right is Greg Coleman, who was a longtime dishwasher at the White Dog. And this picture was actually taken in Havana, Cuba. Uh, we were down there as part of our international sister restaurant project that the White Dog started. 
uh, and where we go to countries that are at odds with the U.S. and uh, see how our foreign policy actually affects the lives of others. So um, Greg decided he would go in. Uh, we bring our, our staff and our, our customers with us, about 20 people in our delegation, and he decided to go into the kitchen and help the uh, Cuban dishwasher wash dishes. And after I saw this picture, I realized why, because she's a pretty cute dishwasher. Uh, but anyway, the, the point of putting Craig, uh, Greg's picture up here is that um, I wanted to talk about the li paying the living wage. And when I first heard about the living wage at a business conference, I had a knee-jerk reaction of, you know, I, I could never uh, pay the living wage to entry-level dishwashers. You know, that's good for other people's businesses, but it would never work in the restaurant business. But then one day, Greg looked up at me and a couple other dishwashers along with him who were prepping uh, vegetables or whatever, and all of a sudden the light bulb went off in my head, and I thought, of course I want anyone who works full-time at my business to be able to pay their rent and buy their food. Of course I want to pay a living wage, but that became, came because of my contact with my employees. Another example is my relationship with, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Another example is my relationship with nature. Uh, I had heard about climate change and we started doing programs at the White Dog in around 1998 about climate change. Uh, but I had, and I knew that Pennsylvania was deregulated as California was, we were the first states to be re uh, deregulated, so I could buy renewable energy, but I wasn't moved to do so until there was a drought in Pennsylvania. And I was up in the woods where I liked uh, to hike uh, and saw uh, the effects of the drought on the woods that I cared about. The leaves were starting to fall off the trees even though it was early August. Uh, there was just an eerie silence as I walked through the woods. The creek was all dried up with dust on the rocks and the, tr the leaves were crackling and there was it just no, not even the birds were singing. And I could just uh, feel uh, the, the effect of the drought. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, uh, this is what it's going to be like with climate change, that parts of the world are going to have droughts and fires and other parts storms and floods. Uh, and so um, I just became a tree hugger, and I ran over to an oak tree and put my arms around it and pressed my face against the bark and promised I would go back to, to Philadelphia and, and sign up for renewable energy, uh, which I did, and the White Dog became the first business uh, back in 2000 uh, to buy 100% of our electricity from re renewable sources. Uh, but that, um, <laughs> thank you, but that came about uh, because I loved the woods. I wanted to, pr to protect what it was that I really cared about. And the third example is about my relationship with community. Uh, I was going past the local public high school uh, and stopped at a red light and was watching the students come out of the school and thinking to myself, you know, this is our local public school, but I don't know these students because my own kids go to a Quaker school, a private Quaker school. I want to know who these kids are. So I went to the principal and we started a mentoring program at the White Dog for our students uh, in 10th grade and 11th grade that were interested in going to the hospitality business. And that program went on for about 15 years with kids working in the office and the in the uh, dining room, in the kitchen, and so on. And I finally uh, discovered who those kids were. They're our kids. <laughs> They're everyone's kids. That all kids are our children. So, um, <laughs> thank you. So the white dog was most known for buying from local farmers. Uh, this was a farm couple. Uh, Judy Dornstrike used to say that when she picked her dr rose geranium, she would imagine our pastry chef James cooking that uh, that rose geranium into a, a pound cake. Um, that's the type of relationship we had with our farmers. And Mark once told me that successful farming is the balance between masculine energies and feminine energies, uh, between efficiency and nurturing. Uh, too much efficiency and not enough nurturing, you might have a very well-run farm, but you're not going to have good tomatoes. On the other hand, too much nurturing without enough efficiency, you might have a great product, but you're going to go out of business because you don't use your time wisely. So I began to see how this is true with our whole economy. And in fact, that our whole economy is out of kilter, that we have too much masculine energy, too much efficiency, and not enough nurturing uh, in our economy. And, and what is a better example than, than industrial agriculture and the factory farming of animals? All, the name of the game here is all about efficiency. How little space can we give that hen? How little light and air? How little food and water? No nurturing here. It's all about efficiency. How can we get the cheapest egg possible? So at the White Dog, we switched to all pastured um, chickens and uh, eggs from pastured hens. Then I found out about the horrors of the factory farming of pigs. Uh, and I was just appalled by this because Pigs are mammals, like our dogs, like us. We all have the emotions that range from despair to joy. Uh, and these mother pigs are kept in these crates where they can't take a step forward or backward or turn around their, their whole lives. 
uh, artificially inseminated babies away, taken, taken away prematurely. And I thought with horror that the pork that I am serving at the White Dog must come from that system because in the United States, 95% or more uh, pork comes from uh, this horrible uh, factory farm system. So I finally came into the kitchen and said, take all the pork off the menu, the bacon, the ham, the pork chops. We can't be a part of the system. And we found a uh, source uh, for pasture pork. This is out in Lancaster County. Pigs like to sleep in the mud in big pig pals. This is how they do it. Um, and then I found out about the plight of the cow, how ca uh, cows are herbivores. They're supposed to eat grass. Um, so we found a source for grass-fed beef. This is Dr. Uh, Bill Elkins with his herd of black Angus and all the meat at the White Dog. Uh, came even our hamburger meat was uh, from grass-fed uh, beef. And so I got to the point where I looked at my menu and I thought, gee, um, uh, we have a, a cruelty-free menu. All of our food and um, man animal products, dairy products, and so on come from small farms where the animals are treated uh, with kindness. This is our goat herder, Dougie, who's the one that kisses her goat's ears. Um, so I thought, gee, this is going to be our market niche, our competitive advantage. This is all about us. We're the only ones in Philadelphia that uh, gets our, our, our meat in this way. And then I thought to myself, well, if you really do care about uh, the pigs, if you really care about the small struggling farmers, if you really care about the environment that's being polluted, the rivers uh, uh, polluted, the fish dying, uh, if you care about the people eating this meat that's full of antibiotics and hormones, then rather than keep this as your market niche, you'll share this information with your competitors. And that was a real turning point for me. Thank you. So I realized that there is no such thing as one sustainable business, that we can only be part of a sustainable system, and that we need to cooperate and share in order to build that sustainable system and build it faster than uh, as things become more urgent. So um, I started a nonprofit, Fair Food, and began putting 20% of my profits into our nonprofit to build our local food system. Uh, we now, the organization is now 14 years old. We have a farm stand that handles products from 90 different farms and food enterprises. I turned to the farmer who brought us in. Uh, we don't even have time for clapping. We have to go so fast here, so. <laughs> but, but thank you. Uh, I turned to the farmer who was bringing us in two pigs a week. Uh, we bought the whole pig and learned how to use all the meat. Uh, would you like to expand your business? And he said yes. And I said, what's holding you back? And he said he needed $30,000 to buy a refrigerated truck so that he could deliver to more restaurants when he came into town. So I loaned the $30,000. So another thing about the business world that I can't stand is, the, is the, the mantra, grow or die. And people would always say, well, how many white dogs are there? And I'd say, oh, well, just one, you know. Uh, and I thought I was a big sissy because I wasn't doing a chain of white dogs when I got an opportunity in New York or D.C. to expand. But I realized that if I started a chain of white dogs, I would lose what was most important to me. And that was the authenticity of the relationships, you know, I had with everyone. Uh, so instead of starting a white dog cafe in someone else's community, I started a black hat in my own, next door. Uh, and this was a store that sold, um, specialized in locally made products, as well as fair trade. Uh, here's a picture of the inside. So I began to see that uh, <laughs> chain stores are like invasive species. They go into other people's communities and smother out the indigenous businesses. So I thought, well, if that's the bad side, how does nature grow? How does nature grow uh, in a healthy way? Well, nature grows deeper in place. Nature grows in its own ecosystem, and we as businesses can do the same thing to grow deeper in our places, to become more diverse, more complex, more adaptive to the needs of our own ecosystem. When we want to start a business as an entrepreneur, instead of doing a chain, we look to see what does my community need? Do we need a, a fair trade coffee roasting company? Do we need um, you know, a, a creamery to make our own ice cream, cheese, whatever? That's the way that we need to grow uh, in this movement. So we can also reimagine growth. It doesn't have to be uh, physical growth at all. Uh, we can grow by increasing our knowledge, by expanding our consciousness, by deepening our relationships, by developing our creativity, by building community, and by having more fun. And I'll briefly show you a couple of ways that we did that at the White Dog Cafe. Uh, we had table talks for uh, visiting uh, authors and th thought leaders on issues of the day. Here's Patch Adams talking about bringing humor uh, to healing. We did storytellings, giving re representation to underserved uh, voices, tales from jails. In this case, it's a, a story of same-sex marriage with a gay couple and a lesbian couple. We did many tours, solar house tours, farm tours, prison tours, et cetera. 
Uh, and here's a fun story. We had all these uh, fun events out in the street in the summertime when it was slow, and this is one of my favorite ones called the Liberty and Justice for All Ball on the eve of Fourth of July, where we had a buffet of uh, dinner with food from the local farmers, and then afterwards I did a little skit called Birth of the Nation, and here we go. Uh, first came a Revolutionary War fellow playing the, uh, the drums. Uh, here I come as a pregnant colonial woman, led by my midwife with a big beach ball under my stomach. Uh, on my back, says George Washington slept here. So my midwife uh, helps me into the bed. She says to the audience, one, two, three, and we all yell, push! And I push the beach ball down through a hidden hole in the bottom of the bed, and then she delivers my twins. Here comes one, here comes the next one. One's called Liberty, the next one's called Justice. They hop up on the stage and do a tap dance to Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> and then we wheel out the Statue of Liberty and we light our sparklers and sing God Bless America. So that's the kind of fun we can have in our own towns. Oftentimes we think we have to spend a lot of money and a lot of carbons to fly to Hawaii or someplace far away. We can have more fun right at home. And many times our local businesses are the ones that put on these events. So. I uh, took a big step in my knowledge when I decided to go down to Chiapas to find out why did the Zapatistas have their revolution on the day that NAFTA went into effect, January 1st, 1994. And I went down and found out that it was because they, they knew that when the borders were lowered, American corporations with subsidized corn, subsidized through the farm bill with our tax dollars, would dump cheap corn into Mexico and put out of business the local farmers. So their revolution was really about local self-reliance. I had never heard about that before. Uh, they wanted to maintain uh, their own uh, fields to be able to grow their corn and sell it in the domestic marketplace, to grow their own fruits and vegetables, to feed their families, to teach their children in their own language, with their own cultures, not be sucked into the monoculture of corporate globalization, but keep their own traditions, their own dress. The women have weaved these uh, bright colored blouses for years, and not be forced into the global economy to work in the maquiladors, the sweatshops along the borders, to make uh, cheap clothes for export to the United States. So uh, I had come down to work with the Chiapas farmers, but then I began to see the relationship with our farmers at home, and how farmers around the world were being driven for the, from their land uh, by development and by corporate farmers. Um, and so I saw that we were all communities everywhere uh, losing our local self-reliance, depending on large corporations to deliver us our basic needs. So I envisioned a new global economy, one that was um, a network of sustainable local economies where basic needs are produced at home. And then we trade globally for what we have in excess for what we don't have at home, or what we have that's unique, that's made by our local craftspeople and innovations by our entrepreneurs. So uh, from that I founded Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And what we do is connect leaders in this movement around North America, Canada, and the United States. We spread solutions of how uh, we can develop local economies, and we drive investment from the stock market to uh, local uh, banks and local investment vehicles. Here's a picture from San Francisco made. We need to invest in our local uh, manufacturing to make basic needs at home and in our local retail businesses that give our towns and cities a unique character and identity. Uh, we also need to change public policy to align with local economies, and we work with the, the American Sustainable Business Council to help do that. Uh, we want prosperity for all. At this time in history, as we're shifting from a global-controlled, corporate-controlled economy to a locally-based green economy, we need more owners. We need many more owners, because this movement is really about decentralization of ownership, decentralization of wealth and power, uh, and stronger democracies. And we want to make sure that those that, who are left out of ownership opportunities in the last economy have them in this new economy. Uh, and there's collective joy in this work. This is our local um, business network in Philadelphia uh, having our, our retreat. And there's collective joy when we work together for a shared vision for our economy and community. So in the end, we're all part of um, the vibrant community of life on Earth. And this uh, community of life on Earth has been greatly damaged uh, by our fossil fuel global economy with little connection to place and all about efficiency and not about nurturing. But when we understand that all life is interconnected spiritually and environmentally, we can feel the suffering of those pigs. We can feel the struggle of the small farmers. We can feel the suffering um, of the polluted water and dying fish uh, in our communities. When we understand that all life is uh, interconnected, um, and when we really care for our communities uh, and, and take uh, 
and lead with love, we can build a sustainable economy that's joyful. When I made the decision to cooperate and share with my competitors, I was afraid that my profits would go down, that my sales would go down. But I didn't make the decision because I figured it out in my head. It was because I felt it in my heart. My love of animals, of nature, of community were greater than my fear. If we do succeed in leaving a viable future for our children and the children of all species, it will be because humankind has evolved evolved to take our rightful place in the Earth community, not as exploiters, but as lovers. Thank you very much.